I'm Helena Norberg-Hodge, the Director of Local Futures, and I want to welcome all of you. And it's a very, very special event for me, as well as for you, I hope, to have these dear colleagues and friends from all over the world joining us here tonight. These are very, very special people. For me, what unites us is a truly global view. We are coming from usually an experience of the less industrialized, less urbanized parts of the world. And so all of us have a deep affection for and respect for food and farming as a very real and important livelihood and reality, something that we often forget in the industrialized world. Um, uh, we've had, we've been bringing this perspective that we call the economics of happiness, what we're promoting. And we've been bringing it to different regions in the world over the past um, eight years now. Ever since our film, The Economics of Happiness, came out, we found that bringing people together in a local area, in a local region, is a very good way to help people connect around this theme of creating a new world, really, a new culture, a new way of doing things, a new way of seeing things. Uh, we, we believe that the divisive nature of the dominant economic system that acts almost as an engine, separating us from nature, separating us from one another, and in the process, separating us from who we are. We are integrally connected. Our minds, our hearts, our bodies are one. And we are one with all the rest of life. And yet we have a, a system, a way of life that keeps separating us further and further. And um, we find ourselves often depressed. Um, I don't think Byron is one of those places where people are quite as depressed and quite as fearful about the future as we find in most places, particularly in the big cities. Many people now will say things like, we humans deserve to extinguish ourselves. We're like a cancer on the, on the earth. We really, you know, deserve to go. No, no, no. We believe that human beings innately want love, want to be loved, and want to give love. We believe that human beings innately are actually thriving when they can experience that sense of connection with others and connection with all of life. But we believe that we are not paying enough attention often to the strings almost of this invisible hand of now a globalized market that keeps pulling us in the wrong direction. So we are encouraging what we call big picture activism. So tonight, this is what we're trying to encourage as a way of looking at the big picture. And the big picture is both empowering when we understand how the dominant system works it's empowering because then we realize that all of these crises that are treated as separate issues are actually linked. Now, we really believe that once we can see that clearly, that in itself is very empowering. It comes down to understanding that we really must pay attention to the economic engine not in order to economize everything, not really in order to create an economics of happiness. It's really about creating cultures of happiness, a way of living where we can really enjoy our sense of feeling connected to others and to nature. Where we are today, this is not something that all over the world can happen you know, instantaneously, but one of the really important parts of the big picture that we can offer you is that when you look around the world, closer to the ground, to the local, more human scale initiatives that are sprouting up across the entire planet, you will feel so inspired and you'll regain your faith in human nature, in human beings. 
who have listened to their hearts, who have listened to their deeper knowledge, who have stopped, you know, and shielded themselves from a propaganda machine that keeps that engine of divisiveness going. They've listened to their hearts, they've listened to their bodies. Often it's through ill health, often it's through crisis that people are forced to stop and wake up and really listen. And it's happening all around the world. Every day we get roughly as much good news in our inbox as we get bad news. And the bad news still happens mainly, I believe, because too many of us are too ignorant of the bigger system that we need to look at. We feel often that in our work, we're dealing with two invisible worlds. We're dealing with the invisible hand of ultimately an economic system, these economic strings that are now coming in the form of a global market, pressuring our governments, shaping our ideas through a global media, through a form of globalized schooling that's disastrous. And our minds and our time, our livelihoods, almost everything we care about are being affected by these invisible threads. Because we don't talk about those threads, we end up manipulated into being fearful of the other. We often end up hating government. I say we, uh, maybe I shouldn't say we, but we are very worried about the swing to the right in many countries, even my native country of Sweden, where people who feel marginalized and insecure in their livelihoods, in their identities, you know, being fragmented and individualized into this competitive, lonely path, they're easily manipulated into the leaders that really are, they're called authoritarian, some people might call them fascist. They're promising to grow the economy for them, they're promising to make their country great and to get rid of the other. It's a frightening trend and it's why we all need to become big picture activists to inform people about the fact that it's not the other that's the problem. And it's not that common idea now that human beings are innately so violent and greedy and competitive. It's really a system that blindly many of us have supported for far too long and in so many invisible ways this system keeps dominating who we are and what happens. The other invisibility that we're working with is the truth of that invisible thread of connection, of oneness, of all life. We all know it and we've been taught it. We hear how indigenous people teach it. If we look at every spiritual tradition, at its core is the teaching of the oneness of life, the inextricable oneness. That spiritual truth is also invisible and also doesn't get the airtime. So here we are in our organization trying to get people to look beyond the core mainstream narrative to expose both of those sides of it. So we, we think we need both resistance and renewal. Resisting those threads which are often intellectual and renewal through coming together. Excuse me, can I ask you uh, for a time check how much? Okay. So, when people today feel that, um, you know, we have, we have a very serious crisis with climate and that we may not live another, you know, some people are warning us we have only 10 years, others are saying a bit more, but it's disastrous. We believe that there is an understanding that among others, you know, Camilla will talk about how the climate rhetoric, the climate narrative has been constructed in a way that is perhaps overly alarmist. It's certainly false in its narrative, its story of how we're going to solve the crisis. So again, we're trying to expose the sort of invisible reality that I hope will leave you feeling that there is more hope there is a greater possibility of doing something than we're generally led to believe. 
does not mean in any way that we're not worried about climate change. We are very worried about it. And our close colleague who would have been with us, Charles Eisenstein, has just written a book about climate that is, is very important. He's pointing out that we shouldn't be focusing so narrowly. We should understand the system that is leading to essentially to ecocide, to deforestation, poisoning water, poisoning our soil, and look at the bigger picture. So when we look at what's happening, we really believe that this is not about bad guys and good guys. The dominant narrative as it's constructed one might think that there are some very nasty people sitting up there in their positions of power, trying to mislead us, trying to destroy the world. There is a lot of money going into misleading ideas, but this, as we see it, is primarily because big money is funding the big ideas. The big money that funds the big ideas, the one thing they don't really want to look at is how business, global banking, may be too big. They're not too big to fail. They're too big for us to allow them to survive. And so part of the big picture activism is exposing the way that global negotiations and global trade treaties are giving far too much power to global banks, global corporations, and that in turn is what informs the dominant narrative. And it does so in many ways that are extremely um, insinuous and would lead one to believe that there's some kind of evil group of nasty men sitting there planning to destroy us all. But ignorance is what seems to be allowing the system to dominate, not seems to be, it is. And it's partly because we are not economically literate enough, we're not clear enough about the various chains of connection that feed that really very destructive economy. So we need a certain basic economic literacy. That includes, for instance, to be aware of the fact that deregulating giant global businesses means that one of the most important contributions to climate change is the global food market. Our governments are actively with every policy virtually, separating us further and further from the sources of our food, the food we eat every day. Food is the only thing we produce that every person needs every day of their life. And we have this insidious, crazy system that we blindly allow to continue that is separating us further and further. One of the latest statistics we got just the other day is that Australia exports 20 tons of plastic bottled water to the UK, and the UK imports here, or we import here, 20 tons of bottled water. <laughs> now, this is not some little side issue. This is what is going on in a, in a systemic way. We have US exporting about a billion tons of beef, importing about a billion tons of beef. We have the UK exporting as much milk and butter as it imports, and we have around the world food from the other side of the world, almost without exception, costing less than food from a mile away. This inversion of prices, where do these prices come from? What is the value of our money in the marketplace? Global financial casinos are determining the price of our water, what happens to our water, whether we export it or import it. It's a craziness that we simply cannot allow to continue. It includes apples flown from England to be washed in South Africa, fish flown from Norway to China to be deboned, fish, fish flown from Scotland, cod, you know, cod off the coast of Scotland, is flown to China to be filleted. Now, this is, this is something that is a, an example of the ignorance that we are all guilty of. Why aren't climate activists talking about that most important cause of climate change? Now, what we have to offer is not only information about that system and the basics of how it works, but we have literally millions of examples from around the world. I mean, we're involved with networks like Via Campesina, the biggest social movement in the world. 
with about 300 million small farmers who can tell you about food sovereignty, about the need to rebuild local food economies. You'll be hearing from Michael Schumann about this amazing movement towards local finance, local business alliances. All of this is happening, but it's not happening yet on a scale that is enough to turn things around. It needs our support. It needs our big picture activism to show people that this is not just a theory, that strengthening local economies with a focus on local food is a win-win-win strategy that is truly the economics of happiness. It's the economics of reconnection. It's what allows us to build community. It's what allows us to connect to the earth and it's beginning to do so at the grassroots. So please help us get the word out. 